Today, we want to spend some time looking at patterns, how they can cause us to build up certain expectations, and how filmmakers can take advantage of that to astonishingly powerful effect. And to do it, we've rounded up five different moments from some of our favorite recent films to dig down on. In no particular order, and for no real reason other than we love them, here are five more completely unranked brilliant moments. Before we get going, it's worth mentioning that all of our brilliant moments today involve some not insignificant spoilers because of the nature of the moments we're looking at. So if the movie we're introducing is one you haven't seen and care about going into fresh, we recommend skipping ahead to the next slot. There are time codes in the description. With that out of the way, let's first look at an abridged scene from The Artist, the 2011 Best Picture winning silent film, where in former silent film star George Valentin despairs at his bankrupt fortune, broken marriage, and failed fame, while Pepe, the extra whose career he launched, beyond his own, finds him missing from her care, and realizes that he might be a real danger to himself. This one brief moment of pulling the rug out from under us is an incredibly dense spectator experience. We feel so many different things so quickly in a row from such a small conceit, so let's take a look at how it works. To begin with, the scene sets up two independent lines of action. Valentin is on his way to suicide, and Pepe is on her way to Valentin. The film alternates between these two different lines of action and develops them in parallel in order to imply that not only are they happening simultaneously, but they are progressing towards their completion at almost exactly the same rate. Take it Together, we very quickly assume exactly what the film wants us to, that these two narrative lines will eventually resolve. But we also carry the exact uncertainty that the film wants us to. We're not sure which will resolve first. It sets up a race between Pepe and her car and Valentin and his gun, and it raises a narrative question. Will she arrive in time or too late? As the intercutting continues, as the pace accelerates, as we grow nearer and nearer to the resolution of this narrative question, the tension intensifies. And by the time we get here, and it seems like the answer cannot be dragged out any longer, we get our answer. And this is the key frame upon which everything hinges. First, we have to interpret it in context. We connect it to the narrative line we just came from, Valentin and the gun. We read it the only way that makes any sense. The gun has fired. But then we cut to here, and our understanding shifts. We realize this sound wasn't coming from Valentin's line of action, but from Pepe's. We recontextualize the shot and rewrite our mental narrative until we cut to here, and our understanding shifts again. We realize this sound was coming from Valentin's line of action and Pepe's line of action, just not in the way we had originally assumed. We realize that the two narrative threads have finally collapsed into one, and we put everything in its place. The narrative question of the scene has resolved itself, it has satisfied our initial expectations while surprising us by how. And it's done one more thing. These three contexts for the bang have given us that rapid-fire whiplash experience that first caught our attention for this moment. First, we felt terror and shock. Second, we felt confusion and surprise. And finally, everything came together and made sense. These just so happen to be the three experiences in this scene. First, Pepe and her terror that she'll be too late. Second, Valentin and his surprise at the noise he didn't expect. And finally, a fulfilling reunion where everything works out, all in the span of a moment. It's a spectacular example of what we think is the essence of a brilliant moment. Filmmakers employing creative cinematic techniques, not just because they're cool, but because they mirror in us a version of the emotional experience that's happening to the people on the screen. 
Next, let's look at a pattern that's almost the exact opposite of the artist's, this time from 10 Cloverfield Lane. Michelle has woken up from a car crash in a bunker and no memory. She's been brought there by Howard, who insists he saved her from some sort of apocalyptic event and that if she leaves, she'll die. Emmett's there too, but he doesn't have much more to go on than Howard's word either. And Howard's word seems a little well, creepy as hell. So, in secret, they make a plan and begin building themselves a DIY hazmat suit to find out. It's all going well until this. This is perchloric acid. It's highly corrosive. It dissolves most biological material on contact with humans right down to the bone. Hey, Howard, uh, what are you showing this to us for? You think I'm an idiot. Um, <laughs> Howard, please, you're going to have to tell us what it is that you're talking about. I'm talking about getting rid of some waste. Tell me what you two are doing with these. You tell me what you two are playing Howard, right now. Listen, just take it easy. Take it easy. Come Howard, on. No. Howard, come on. Please, I'm Howard. I'm giving you one chance. Hey. Howard, just calm down. One chance to answer with some dignity, or I swear to God, you're going into this barrel while you're alive to feel it. It was me. All right? Not her. It's just me. No, no, no. She, we, stay we, out of this, all right? She doesn't have a clue what you're talking about. I wanted your gun, and so I was thinking about making a weapon to get it from you. I want her to respect me the way that she respects you. I'm not saying that I was right, okay? And I'm sorry. You're sorry? I'm sorry. I accept your apology. If you're anything like us, you probably did not see that coming on your first watch through. And it's a cool counterpoint to the artist's payoff. One seems to be leading us towards a gunshot conclusion, but surprisingly doesn't, while the other seems to mercifully turn us away from any bloodshed before unleashing its gunfire unexpectedly. Each of them building up a pattern that seems to point us increasingly towards an outcome that it finally subverts in the last minute. And here in the bunker, while traditional dramatic structure plays a role in suggesting certain expectations, we're most excited about the role of the camera in all of it. Check it out. Apart from a few insert shots of hands and a master three shot that we only see a few times, this scene is covered almost entirely in over the shoulders. But not just any over the shoulders, six different over the shoulders arranged in pairs along three different axes so that at any given time, the filmmaking is focusing on the dynamics of only one two person relationship in the dramatic triangle. So when Michelle and Emmett are freaking out together about what's about to happen, we see this shot on this axis. And when they're each watching Howard slowly transform into a very dangerous man, we watch from these two axes. And when Howard is trying to sniff out the rat between them, the over-the-shoulder swings wildly from one axis to the other like a desperate man searching desperately. As Michelle falls under his gaze and we're meant to worry that he will rightly realize she's to blame, we begin to favor her axis with Howard. Until finally, Emmett fesses up and takes all the blame, causing us to suddenly lock in on the Howard-Emmett axis and set off an incredibly tense conflict between them like this. As a result, Michelle is safe, and her safety is reflected in the camera choices. We no longer see her in the same frame or participating in the same dramatic conflict with Howard. Instead, we focus on her axis with Emmett, first pleading with him not to do this, and then later grateful and relieved towards him. We see this shot a total of three times, each of them increasingly safe from the danger until the shot itself begins to feel like a safe space. And when Emmett and Howard finally make amends in their paired over the shoulders here, it seems like that conflict is resolved too. So in our view, leaves their conflict for hopefully the last time and heads over to the safe shot of Michelle breathing a sigh of relief, we breathe a sigh of relief with her when the moment unravels in an instant. The barrel of the gun intrudes just into the edge of our safe frame and 
The safety of this peaceful shot is shattered. We are shocked to have been misled by the story and its filmmaking, just like Michelle is shocked to have been misled by Howard's forgiveness. We were made to look left, then the danger came in quietly from the right, and we end up blindsided by violence we would have seen coming 30 seconds prior. Immediately, Emmett is banished from the frame. We cut to the only axis that remains between Howard and Michelle. And, as if dissolved by acid, all that remains of Emmett is his bloodstain on the wall. For our next brilliant moment, we're sticking with guns and violence for a scene from the climax of Jarhead. The film follows Marine Scout Sniper Swafford as he trains and then deploys for what will eventually become Desert Storm. But Desert Storm is nothing like his father's deployment in Vietnam. We are instead introduced to a lifestyle where boredom, pointlessness, and the absurd dominate. An existential malaise sets in, and eventually, the promise of violence begins to grow attractive because at least it means being good for something. So, after an hour of inaction when Swafford and his partner Troy are finally assigned a mission to assassinate a high-ranking officer in a nearby airfield tower, we get this. Romeo, Golf Charlie. Romeo, Golf Charlie. This is Lima 2 Sierra. Over. Officers in control tower. Over. That's what they look like, huh? Range. 900 yards. Windage. 5 to 7 west to east. Romeo Golf Charlie, Romeo Golf Charlie, requesting permission to take the shot, over. Set. We have the shot, over. Affirmative, out. Permission to fire. Are you on? Oh, we got air. I'm calling it in. It's like a combination of the artist's bang, Mr. Wreck, with 10 Cloverfield Lane's last minute intrusion, but this time, the violence is the hope rather than the fear. And Mendes sets this up in quite a few ways, explicitly by having the characters quickly voice their anxiety, but he also works in a number of subtler ways to help make us ache for a violent release despite our best ethics. First, he presents the process as an incredibly intimate one. All of the filmic language used for lining up this shot belong more to a gentle romance than a war film. The camera lives in the super tight kissing distance close-ups and sensitive tactile macro shots. It lingers on the sense of gentle touch where the dialing of a knob is more akin to brushing away a lock of hair than preparing for execution. And all this really perverts violence. It makes violence feel gentle and comfortable. It also makes interruptions to said violence feel, well, violent. The loudest and most disturbing parts of the scene are Troy jabbering on the radio and the door banging open to stop them in the end, the climactic event that completely ruins the visual intimacy. This final, unexpected violence interruption introduces a series of increasingly wide-angled shots that ends in a heartbreakingly impersonal master. But there's a second conceit here that's even more important to our sense of mounting tension, and that's the re-evocation of a previously established pattern. Sam Mendes spends a tremendous amount of time in the first half of the film introducing us to this intimate relationship between man and his gun. From the reading of distances, to the procedural communication, to the unforgettable triplicate of fire. 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 We know how this song and dance goes by now, and that's really important. In this scene, we're not building out into an unknown void where at some unknown point we hope there will be a gunshot. No, this routine allows us to locate ourselves somewhere along a mental timeline with a concrete sense of how close we really are to its end. 
With the finish line in view, we begin to expect a certain resolution. We begin to count on that expected resolution, and we begin to actively look forward to that expectation, which, in this case, happens to be violence. So, when the door bursts open with a bang and the pattern completes itself, but not in the way we've learned to expect, we take a look at ourselves and what's just been happening and realize that all it took was a little nudge, and we've been sitting here hoping to see our hero make a stranger die. For our fourth moment, we're turning to the climax from You Were Never Really Here, for a completely different way to achieve a very similar feeling. We think this movie is ultimately genius in its empathy and insight into pain and violence, both as victim and perpetrator. But you should be aware that this moment involves some really graphic examples of violence, murder, and child abuse. And if you often find yourself uncomfortable with that kind of thing, you might want to skip ahead. With that being said, early in the film, our protagonist Joe is hired to track down a missing girl named Nina. After finding the house she's being held in, he goes inside to rescue her, and it looks like this. And this, on its own, is a pretty brilliant sequence. Joe is presented as this ultra-badass man with nothing but hammer pursuing child abusers, which practically screams out guilt-free skull-bashing fun for us to expect. Except, that's not what we get at all. This rotating surveillance camera aesthetic completely subverts normal fight sequence suspense structure. Instead of ramping up slowly to a violent payoff we feel like we both want and have earned, this sequence alternately shocks us with violence and then deprives us of it, in such a way that we can never quite get our expectations underneath us. It continuously frustrates us by giving us violence we didn't want yet and then taking it away just as we start wanting it. It is violence at its least satisfying. Joe rescues Nina, but it doesn't last. Men track him down and take her back from him. They are city police bought by the rich and powerful to support a child's sex ring where they trade children back and forth. And Nina is the governor's favorite. By the time Joe figures all this out, he's lost just about everything he cares about in life and is almost entirely consumed with hatred and us along with it. He heads to the governor's a state hammer in hand and finally we get our sequence. And wow. If Jarhead shocks us with how we could feel about violence, this sequence absolutely rattles us to our core. First, it evokes the previous Hammer Revenge sequence in style, editing, pattern, and music. We're being cued to expect at least some violence. We know we got it last time, although we weren't quite ready for it. This time, we know what we're getting and how we're getting it, so we begin to expect and even crave it. But this time, we get even less. We are like Pavlovian dogs, being reminded by the film's familiar stylistic patterns that it's feeding time. But all we get is an empty bowl. This is massively disappointing, but we're led not to give up yet. We're cued to expect at least some violence. The film finally shifts away from this surveillance style that we've come to know by now promises nothing but frustration and returns to a more traditional continuity, diegetic sound, and camera movement. This leads us to expect something different, something more, something climactic. And we've all imagined what it will be, a hammer in the head of the governor. And as every part of the filmmaking pushes us towards this endpoint and we glide towards this future expected act of violence, finally we arrive, and then it all falls flat. 
there will be absolutely no violence. How deeply unsatisfying. And this is why it's brilliant. Because the next thing that happens is that Joe breaks down. And our feelings match his. And it gives us immense insight into his human condition. Because in this moment, we are kind of the same. And we realize that just like we wanted this, Joe needed this. Joe hated these characters on screen. These men he had never even met. Because he equated them with the child abusers in his life. And when Joe collapses in pain, when this hatred has nowhere else to go but back inwards, we kind of understand it. Because we feel real really freaking lousy too. The disappointment we feel at the plot is just a miniature model of the disappointment he feels at being unable to satisfy an outlet for his hate. This moment is such a phenomenal investigation of how anger, rage, and violence are actually just protective mechanisms against otherwise inescapable pain. And Lynn Ramsey pulls it off by masterfully manipulating us along the emotional experience of Joe through her almost maniacal frustration of the patterns she knows we expect. Finally, we turn to our last scene, this time from Room. Room finds five-year-old Jack and his 24-year-old mother Joy captive in, well, a room. They are held there by old Nick, a man we come to learn kidnapped Joy as a teen and then with her fathered Jack. But he's never really met Jack. Joy never lets him near her son, even though he's tried. She always hides him away in a cabinet to sleep when old Nick comes to visit and molest her. Eventually, Joy helps Jack escape and the police find where she's being held. She is rescued and our scene here finds Jack waking up alone in an entirely new place to the sounds of his new step-grandfather milling about downstairs. She gets home. Thanks. Thanks again. Pretty hungry. Oh, I know. Got something in the kitchen, I think. Oh, yes. I've got something very tasty in the kitchen, I think. Let me see what's here. Hello. I didn't know you were up. While this scene might seem entirely ordinary on its surface, in the context of the film, we couldn't help but feel an overwhelming sense of dread here, a growing concern that Joy's stepfather, Leo, might not have the best intentions. Of course, it turns out that we're mercifully wrong. He's nothing more than a kind and caring man trying his best to connect with his new grandson. But for a second there, we could swear it was going another direction. And upon closer inspection, this wasn't just a hunch, but a careful manipulation on behalf of the film. Consider in context of our first encounter with old Nick here. Hey. Shh. Got enough hey, Jack. Hey. Let's go to bed. You want some candy? You like candy? Look at how Jack, curled up in a safe hiding place, regards each of these two characters in POV, both times peering through something, slats or a railing, both times too shy to look directly at their face such that the camera conceals it, both times a man attempts to win his affection first by toys and play, and then by sweets and candy. Notice how in both scenes the goal of the man in question is to lure Jack out of his hiding place. The difference, of course, is that one relationship is wholesome while the other is anything but. But you couldn't tell that from the way it's written, staged, and shot. And that's exactly the point. These two relationships look the same despite fundamental differences because we aren't supposed to be able to distinguish between them. The filmmaking re-evokes an old, unsuitable pattern for engaging with a strange man because the only experience Jack has ever really had with an adult man has been with his captor. He is a child whose only schema for adult relationships is abusive. So, when choosing a way to perceive a new adult man, there is only one available aesthetic to Jack and therefore us. This is the tragedy of trauma. It extends past the event itself and infects everything that comes after it, such that even the non-traumatic is seen through traumatic eyes. So when the scene ends with almost nothing happening at all, just a simple conversation, no abuse, no reveal, no big moment, no melodramatic hug, it's the best thing we could have hoped for, because it's not traumatic, it's just ordinary. And in a childhood and a movie where everything has been traumatic, ordinary can mean a hell of a lot. By its very nature, drama is about desire. 
positive desire wanting something to happen, or negative desire definitely wanting something to not happen. This is hope and fear. So when drama is employed in a narrative space, it raises the dramatic question. Will what we want or fear happen or won't it? Will Pepe arrive in time? Will Howard dissolve them in acid? Will Swafford get to do something in the war? Will Joe have his revenge? Will Jack be safe alone with his granddad? And patterns are structures designed to be guessed at. Progressions that imply a direction. It seems predictable where they're heading, if uncertain whether they'll get there. All these moments employ patterns that point us in the direction of an answer to their main dramatic question. They suggest that they will at least resolve one way or another and soon. And then, at the 11th hour, they all complete their patterns in complicated, unexpected ways, giving us answers that cause confusion or shock or outrage or bloodlust or relief. And by promising us an answer, nudging us into guessing what it will be and then upending it, they reveal to us the complexities of what we've wanted all along and how we feel about getting it or not. And they guide us through this moment with such care that the feelings they reveal just so happen to be the same ones our characters are feeling. And in this, we learn something about them, we learn something about us, and how we're more alike these characters than we would have guessed. Which is why we think all five of these moments are utterly brilliant. So, what do you think? Disagree with any of our interpretations? Have any other brilliant moments? Let us know in the comments below, and be sure to subscribe for more brilliant moments and more Cinefix movie lists.